Hey, good morning. We're just so thankful that you're tuning in to to watch the Word of God being preached today. And it's my prayer over you, over myself, over my family, over our church family, that God will just take us today and mold us more and more into the image of Christ. That it won't be any more about me and what I want and what I think, but that selfishness will go away and I will just pursue the heart of God and that his word will just change me every single day. Now, let me start off with this question. Have you ever had just one of those boneheaded moments where you did something really dumb? Now, I hate to admit that I've had quite a few of those in my life, but one of those was just a couple weeks ago. We were cooking a good amount of corn and having a little family get together, and the corn was in a metal pot, and Bethany said, hey, can you go ahead and take it off the heat and load it up? So in my moment of just sheer brilliance, I went and I grabbed this metal pot with two hands until my brain said, hey, dum-dum, that's hot. (laughs) And it just kind of goes back to those days where you teach your kids not to touch something hot, not to get into something that could be dangerous for them. When I was a kid, my parents said things like, hey, beware of the baseboard heater. Beware of getting too close to water if you can't swim. Beware of traffic. Beware of pulling the cat's tail. (laughs) Actually, speaking of cats, I'll never forget when our son, Joe, is he's almost eight now. But when he was less than a year, he had just learned how to crawl. The cat's litter box was in our shared kind of kitchen laundry room area. And it was one of those moments where he was playing so well on the floor with toys. He was doing fine. And Bethany left the room for literally probably just a couple minutes to go put something away. And when she came back, back, he was nowhere to be seen. So as a parent, that was our first child. So we were just kind of overprotective about everything. She was searching all over the house. And finally, she finds him in the litter box. Uh, He had litter in his mouth. At least we chose to believe that that's all that it was. And that was just one of the moments that we were like, man, we are just the worst parents in the world. And then you get together with other parents who are like, oh no, I can one-up that one. <laughs> and now after three kids, we actually feed our kids litter. No, no, I'm just kidding there. Don't call CPS on us. But, but as horrifying as this was, as new parents, it was also a good teaching moment. We said, Joas, no touch, no touch. That is off limits. Beware. And today we're going to look a little deeper into that word beware, because in a lot of ways we are that child and God is trying to teach us what it looks like to actually walk in faith, how to be strong, how to be courageous in God's mighty power. And we are that child that can be controlled by fear so easily when we're told in God's word that is redeemed children of God, we're not given a spirit of fear and timidity, but instead we're given a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. And if you're visiting with us today, we're in the fifth week of this series in the book of Joshua called Strong Courage Over Fear. We've seen God's amazing promise to Joshua as the new new leader over the Israelites. And to us, no matter what we come up against in this life, he said, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And then we saw God kind of back that promise up by protecting two spies in Jericho and grafting a prostitute into the family of God where her life was completely transformed. We saw God's call for radical obedience in Joshua 3 and 4 as God stopped the Jordan upstream so about 2 million Israelites could cross over on dry riverbed. Last week in Joshua 6, we learned an amazing God statement. And here's what it says. We fight from victory, not for victory. And that is so important for our lives because Jesus already conquered the grave. He's conquered the forces of hell. And those who walk in him, when we get up in the morning, we are in victory and we work from that victory, not for victory. And we have that victory on this side of eternity and in heaven for all eternity.
And now today, if you'll grab your Bibles for me, turn to the book of Joshua, sixth book of the Old Testament, pretty early on in, the, in your Bible, in the Old Testament, and turn to Joshua chapter 7. We're going to be in 7 and 8 today as we talk about a couple things that we need to be aware of so we don't walk in defeat in the land of victory. And just like the last few weeks here, when we walk through a couple chapters in one message, we're not going to be able to read every single verse. So please, don't just take me at my word. I want you to study it for yourself. I want you to go deeper. But here we are in chapter 7. After this really big victory where they just conquered the city of Jericho, they were obedient to follow God's plan that looked like craziness. And that was the first victory of many for God's people as it started to get a lot more real that this land was going to be home. And then, all of a sudden, the tide turns. This chapter starts off with this small but very important word, but. In other words, but, even though things are good, there's been victory, there's excitement in the camp, but all that's going to change right here. And if you're a note taker, grab your outlines for me. You can go to fccgreensburg.com. Online service is right there on the homepage. Click on that. Click on today's date. You can download those, those outlines if you like to take notes. You can also go to your YouVersion Bible app. Click on more. Click on events. Click on our church. And that will take you right to kind of our online notes for today. So here's what I want you to see. Beware of sin in the camp. Beware of sin in your life. See, God had made it very clear before the battle of Jericho that all the things made of precious metal were to go into the treasury of the Lord as first fruits, as this was the first battle um, that they were in. But Achan, whose name simply means trouble, along with his family who were accomplices, they went against this very clear order and they kept some of it for themselves. They even hid it, showing they knew that they were doing wrong. And listen, God was furious. He had made this very clear. Joshua had made it very clear that nothing, none of those spoils were to be taken. And yet, they did it anyways. And we know from studying scripture that we have a God of, of yes, grace and compar- compassion and mercy. But at the same time, he's a God of justice and righteousness. And we don't talk about that enough. We have a God who calls us to be holy as he is holy. And the way Israel found out that they were kind of in trouble here is because they got a little cocky and they only sent a small group of soldiers to take ta- down the town of Ai. And when the fighting men of Ai defied all odds and spanked the Israelites in battle, killing 36 of them and causing the rest of them to retreat with their tail between their legs, Joshua was just confused. And he was spiritually in tune enough with God to know that something was off. Something was wrong. See, God had made this great promise only to have them get defeated in their second battle. I hear you, God. And so one of the towns that was supposed to be an easy victory here actually became defeat. So what's, go- what, what's going on? Joshua wanted to know. And as he fell face down before the Lord, before the ark of the Lord, and he was grumbling and complaining a little bit, I want to go back to Egypt kind of talk, and God made it clear what the problem was. Actually, let's go ahead and read this together. In Joshua chapter 7, and let's start here in verse 10. Joshua 7, you should be here with me. And let's read verses 10 through 13. The Lord said to Joshua, stand up. What are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. This is why the Israelites cannot stand against the enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. Okay? So, next we see this kind of process of bringing the nation forward and weeding them out until finally Achan and his family are the ones left standing there in their shame, in their guilt. Uh, There's no question. They are guilty. And as hard as this is to kind of understand, they were put to death. 
And one thing I, I always want you to see when we're in the Old Testament talking about the Israelites who, who followed that, that old covenant is that Christ didn't come to change it all. He came to fulfill it. And today we live under a new covenant that was the old covenant was fulfilled and things do look a little different today as children of God who are covered by the blood of Jesus. And we have the ability standing 3,400 years later to see the big picture of what sin does, that we can never take sin lightly. And as hard as this is to accept that God had them killed, listen, he is God. He knew the situation. He knew hearts and it was what he called them to do. So listen, if you're newer to the Bible Today, when I talk about sin, I'm talking about those things that go against the heart of God that are found in the Word of God. And I like how Judson Cornwall dealt with this very difficult subject. Here's what he said. He said, why is God so extremely severe in dealing with sin? Simply because sin is a broken law, a broken relationship, a broken fellowship, it produces a broken life. And then we have the, the very practical words of the great evangelist, Billy Graham, who said, The cause of all trouble, the root of all sorrow, the dread of every man lies in this one word, sin. It has crippled the nature of man. It has caused man to be caught in the devil's trap. But now I want you to see here God's desire for each of our hearts in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. It says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again. What's he talking about again? Because they've already been there. When God saved them, he ripped that burden of slavery off of them. But he says, do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. See, that's what sin does. It puts us in bondage. And yet you're going to hear me about every week warn us against this cultural Christianity that seeks to make sin in any lifestyle we choose okay in order to fit into the world and be more quote-unquote welcoming. But here's the problem with that mindset. People don't come to hear the word to get more of the world. You ever thought about that? If the world truly satisfied, we wouldn't be here watching today. And if you look at the facts Churches that have strayed away from preaching the whole counsel of God, churches that have strayed away from this idea that we truly believe that the word of God is perfect, but churches that don't believe that, churches that are watering it down, that are accepting sin that breaks the heart of God, who are actually calling sin good, those are the churches that are in general having a hard time keeping their doors open. Why is that the case? It's simple because God refuses to bless that disobedience and sin no matter how much we justify it and try to make it seem okay and no matter how much we dress it up, it's still sin. So apparently the Apostle Paul say, saw the same kind of mindset in his culture in his day and he made it clear here in Romans 6, starting in verse 1, and I'm actually going to read this to you from the, the New Living Translation. It just made it come alive a little more. But in Romans 6, verse 1, Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? And then he says, of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. But here's, here's the struggle. You and I both come to this moment here today with sin that we still struggle with in our lives. And I can tell you from living about the same number of years with Christ that I lived without Christ in my life, I can tell you it's tough. You know this. It's tough to pursue holiness in Christ. And although I wouldn't change it for anything, the hardest thing I've ever done is try to live 100% sold out for Jesus because it truly means dying to self. It is easy to choose the flesh, but it's hard to die to it. And only through surrendering more and more uh, to the Holy Spirit's leading and power can we overcome the sin that we struggle with every day. 
So let's talk about this, okay? Because listen, if we can't talk about this in the church, then why are we even here, okay? If we got to come and be all churchy, then we've missed the boat. We've missed the point. And we can relate to Paul here in Romans chapter 7, verse 15, when he says, I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right. I want to honor God, he says, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate, and that's sin. So, so what sin or what sins are you just battling with today? Can we just be real here? What, what needs to go for us to truly walk in freedom and the grace of Christ? Is it selfishness and pride? Man, I fight this every single day. Is it laziness and complacency? Is it sexual sin that goes outside of God's boundaries of, of a husband and wife in a relationship, in a sexual relationship, living faithful to one another while pursuing the heart of God as one? Are we trying to do something outside of all those boundaries? Man, it's not going to work out well. Is it this pursuit to have the, the nicest home or car or boat or whatever? And if I'm honest, that comes before Jesus. Is it some addiction that controls me? This could be all kinds of things. Of course, we always talk about alcohol and drugs, but, but what about video games and pornography and shopping and, and man, my phone that you heard go off earlier, right? Uh, that's something that could be so easy to spend way too much time on. What about the pursuit of beauty or anything else that I put on the throne of my heart when that's the only place that Jesus belongs or the place that only Jesus belongs? It could be dirty business practices. It could be anger or slander or lying or manipulation or gossip or not submitting to leadership. And man, the list goes on and on. And today, Lord, we're asking you to reveal anything in us that is unclean, that is impure, so that we may know you deeper, we may know you more intimately. And while it would be easy to be like, man, Ray, you just listed a whole bunch of stuff that I'm thinking God doesn't want me to have any more fun, right? Well, that couldn't be further from the truth because while some of this stuff is fun in the moment, and I'll give you that, I've, I've sadly done too many of those things myself. But while it's fun in the moment, it's just not worth where it leads and what it does. The anonymous quote that you've probably heard before just nails it. It says, sin will take you farther than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will cost you more than you want to pay. See, God knows where sin leads. He knows where it really leaves you mentally when your head hits the pillow at night. And he even knows how it can mess up everything, just like Achan's sin in this story killed 36 people. See, sin causes all kinds of damage, not just to ourselves like we try to pretend, but also to those we love and our community around us. And sin has a way of keeping us from truly walking and living in the freedom and purpose that we're designed to walk in. And yet the greatest news is from Romans 5, 8 that teaches us this. It says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So the old hymn by Robert Lowry puts this better than my words can. He said, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. See, it was on the cross of Calvary that our perfect sinless Savior gave his life, taking the sins of the world upon his shoulders. And it was in the baptism waters that we repent of our sins, that we die to ourselves, and we rise again to new life, washed as white as snow, filled with the Holy Spirit. Spirit. And that's why we can sing, O oh, precious is the flow that makes me as white as snow. No other found I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. I can't earn it. I can't give enough. I can't preach enough. It's only by the blood of Jesus that I am set free. And then the last thing I need to do as a disciple of Jesus is let sin enslave me again as a child of God. Okay, I've been there, I've done that, I've gotten the t-shirt, and I don't want to go back. And so the last thing I need to do is put new chains on me when I'm a child of God that's supposed to be freed up, that's supposed to be freed up to live for Him. I've already been set free. Why would I go back to Egypt? 
So beware of the sin in the camp. Be honest about your sin. Don't try to make excuses. Don't let other people make excuses for it. Lay it every day at the feet of Jesus. Let him transform you to overcome that sin by his power and realize that there is forgiveness and freedom in Christ. And for that, I am so thankful just like you are. Okay, and then the last warning I have for you is this. Beware of what God will do through people of the word. Beware of what God will do through people devoted and immersed in studying and living out the word of God. Now, I know that sounds funny to say beware of what God will do through people of the word because it sounds more like a warning for Satan than it is for us. And, and it is a warning for Satan. And he's scared of people of the word. But, but listen, it's also a warning for us, okay? Because the, the things that happen when we're not people of the word, our lives just don't head in the direction that God has for us. See, when God's on the throne of my heart, when he is that living water that, man, I am chugging every single day, when he's the bread of life that I am devouring, that is my nourishment every day, get ready. Because God is going to do incredible things in and through those who are surrendered to his word, his will, and his ways. Okay, so let's pick up in our story here. Let's pick back up. After this rough day of discovering sin in the camp, taking care of it, which had to be a heartbreak to everybody there, God gives a familiar promise to Joshua. He reminds him, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Basically, take the whole army. I have delivered AI into your hands, but this time, guys, this is so different from Jericho. Do you remember how, from a tactical standpoint, Jericho made no sense, marching around the city, blowing trumpets, expecting God to knock down the walls, and guess what? Because of their radical obedience that looked like craziness to, to everyone around them, God did it, and he moved through that. And listen, God doesn't have to make sense in our mind. When we follow him, amazing things happen. And his ways are higher than way, our ways. His ways are greater than our ways. This time, we see kind of the opposite, though, when they go up against AI. Uh, military generals would have been uh, impressed with this approach, okay? They set up a surprise ambush on one side of the city. And then they marched on the other side. The king and his men saw them marching toward them. And so they went out a little cocky. They had already defeated the Israelites once. So they came out against the Israelites. A part of their tactical plan was they retreated. And the men weren't surprised because they'd already retreated from them once. And so they chased after them and they left the city unguarded. And that's when the, the ambush they had set up, they were able to go right into the city. They were able to burn it down and destroy the city, destroy this army as well. And, and then as, they're, as God's people are celebrating this victory, they're setting up a memorial to God. They're giving him his offerings and praise and worship that he deserves for, for giving this victory. Then we read these words in Joshua chapter 8, verses 34 and 35. Here's what it says, Joshua 8, 34. Afterward, Joshua read all the words of the law, the blessings and the curses, just as it was written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses, there was not a word of all that Moses had commanded that Joshua did not read to the whole assembly of Israel, including the women and the children and the foreigners who lived among them. It is important for us to understand context of what Joshua was doing here and how this began with Moses. In Exodus 19 and 20, God had given the law through Moses at Mount Sinai and the people had accepted it and promised to obey it. Okay, And then Moses did this again uh, at the edge of Canaan. He explained the law in the plains of Moab. Okay, he needed to do that again. And now Joshua and the people are in the land of promise. They've had two victories, and it's important to reaffirm their obedience and commitment to the word of God. Now, this area between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim was a natural amphitheater. And all the Israelites, two million of them, could clearly hear the word of God being read to them because of this natural amphitheater. And each time a blessing or a curse was read, the people would shout, Amen. That meant it is true, or, or so be it. 
and, and I will obey and I will follow the word and I won't stray to the right or to the left. I won't stray to, to legalism or to theological liberalism. And Warren Wearsby just brought this home beautifully when he said this. He said, today God's people stand in the valley between two mounts. Mount Calvary, where Jesus died for our sins, and Mount Olivet, where Zechariah 14.4 tells us he will return in power and great glory. The Old Testament prophets saw the Messiah's suffering and glory, but they did not see the valley between their era and this present age of the church. He says believers today aren't living under the curse of the law because Jesus bore that curse on a tree or on the cross. In Christ, believers are blessed with every spiritual blessing because of the grace of God. So let me ask you this. Where do we learn about these promises for those who walk by faith? Where do we see the example of the early church that we're called to model? Where do we read the words of life that Jesus spoke into the despised, the rejected, and the sick? Where do you go to find this love letter from God to those who are made in his image? Right here, okay? Right here in the word of God. And this word is living and active, discerning the thoughts and the attentions of the heart. It's a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. This word is the truth in a world of, of just chaos and lies. This scripture is breathed from God to us to teach and rebuke and correct and train us for every good work. The word won't return void, but it will accomplish God's purposes. These words are, are spirit and life. And I think most of you probably figured out that I've just been quoting several scriptures to you right there. But there's one last passage that I want you to see here from Acts 17, 11, where we're given this wonderful example to follow as we receive the word with all eagerness and we examine it daily so that we will walk in the full life that's found in Jesus Christ. Let me explain this this way. Two cows were grazing in a pasture when they saw a milk truck pass by. On the side of the truck were the words pasteurized, homogenized, standardized, vitamin A added. One cow kind of sighed and he said to the other one, he said, you know, it makes you feel sort of inadequate, doesn't it? <laughs> and you know, people try to improve on milk and I don't know the pros and cons to that, but one thing you will never be able to improve upon is the word of God. 1 Peter 2.2 2 tells us that it is pure spiritual milk, so we will grow up into salvation. It does not need any pasteurizing, standardizing, or homogenizing. It doesn't need anything added, and it doesn't need anything taken away, okay? It doesn't need our liberalism or our legalism. And just like me touching a hot stove or a, or a hot pan or my baby boy eating kitty litter, we're told to beware of the devastation of sin that ultimately leads to eternal death. And as we step back and we look at the big picture of Joshua and God's people taking the land of Canaan, we know that this initial defeat at Ai was their only defeat in this campaign in Canaan. And FCC Greensburg, I want to speak to you here for just a moment. As we look back over the almost 190-year history of this body of believers, a rich history here in this church, we see some incredible victories over the forces of hell for the kingdom of God. But sadly, we also see a few times where sin caused chaos, devastation, and defeat. And it was only when this church stood on the word of God, which we still do, and refused to compromise, that incredible healing and growth happened. So, beware of sin in the camp. Beware of sin in our lives and keep your eyes focused on the word of God, living it out every single day. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for how it just meets us right in our stuff and junk and whatever's going on in our life. And, and God, I just pray that you will have your way, that your word will be powerful, that your Holy Spirit will speak into our lives and, and where we may have sin that, that we continue to run to instead of running to you, Jesus, that we will surrender that today and by victory walk in your awesome power. So God, take our sin, take our struggles, and thank you for forgiving us and setting us free. Help us not to run back and put chains on 
and be enslaved by that sin. Father, we also pray that you will help us. I know how easy it is to get out of the word, to not be disciplined in getting into the word. Father, help us to realize what's most important in life and what's most important in our growth, in our faith, and that's getting into your word, being a part of your church. And so, Father, help us to focus on your word, on seeking you in prayer, on, on doing life with other believers, and help us to just always put you in first place in our life. Thank you for your word today. Thank you for how it speaks to us. And God, may you stir our hearts so we will look more like Jesus today and tomorrow than we did yesterday. So thank you for your word, Jesus. We pray all this in your precious name. God's people said, amen and amen. Hey, quick invitation. If you are ready to surrender your life to the Lordship of Jesus, the scriptures are very clear. That starts by believing in Jesus as the Son of God, your Messiah, okay? And then we repent. That means to turn away from that old lifestyle. We confess Him as our our Lord and Savior as we confess our sins before Him. And then we are baptized into Him for the forgiveness of our sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so I would love to walk you through all those scriptures and what scripture says to you. And if you need help on this journey, we would love to walk alongside you. So give me a call, 812-663-8488. My name's Ray. There's some others here who would love to help you. Let us know. Give us a call or email me at ray at fccgreensburg.com. Hey, God bless you. And we pray that you have a wonderful week as you seek the heart of God.